Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Maddie. I get to be one of the pastors here at Epiphany, and I get to walk us into uh, God's Word and into a conversation really centered on why we're gathered specifically on this day. Now, today is the day that we celebrate as a church across the world, honed in and zoned in on what is most important when it, we talk about our faith, when we talk about our relationship to God. That is Jesus Christ being crucified, killed as a representative and a ransom for the sin that we have committed that separate us from God. And that he did not stay dead but was resurrected and brought to new life so that we could know that he is who he says he is. Now, the reason that we're having this conversation this weekend, this Sunday, is not because we believe that this weekend is the exact weekend that it happened in history. We know that because we change when Easter is every year. I don't know if you know this, but how Easter is decided upon is it is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. So today, it's kind of just like any other day on the calendar, except that we choose to make a special importance centered around that which is most important, what it means to us. See, Easter, what it doesn't mean and can't mean, the like very pinnacle of what it is, can't be, hey, we go to church, and we listen to a guy talk for a little while, we sing some songs, maybe we go get some food, maybe take a nap. Like that can't be everything about what Easter actually is. Instead, it is that Christ died and didn't stay dead. That is the very pinnacle. And that claim right there that Jesus didn't stay dead is something that in fact demands response from anyone and everyone who comes into contact with that claim. You for yourself, you get to decide what you're gonna do with the claim that Jesus didn't stay dead, but you've gotta respond. And so what I'm gonna do for us is I'm gonna walk us through a chunk of Bible that continues to claim over and over and over again that Jesus didn't stay dead. And as we go through it, what I want you to do is I want you to actually see what is the most common response of most people across the world still to this day in how they look at the death of Jesus Christ and the claim that he didn't stay dead. By the time we're done, what I'm gonna impress you to do is to decide for yourself what your response to Easter is, the real Easter. Because either Easter is the most important day of our calendar, or it's the most important event in history, which informs our past, present, and future, or it doesn't mean anything at all, and someone just made it all up. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 50. Now, this is just after Jesus has been killed. It says, now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. He was a member of the Jewish high council but he had not agreed with the decision and actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He went to Pilate, as the Roman guy responsible for getting Jesus killed, and asked for Jesus' body. Then he took the body down from the cross and wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb that had been carved out of rock. This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation, as the Sabbath was about to begin. As his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun. So they rested as was required by the law. What you just see here with Joseph and, and these women from Galilee is in fact the most common response that people have when you talk about Jesus. Most people actually agree that Jesus probably lived and was probably crucified by the Jewish leaders under Roman authority. And therefore what Jesus gets from most people is that he was probably okay. He was probably even half decent. He probably even deserves to be honored as someone who is dead. And that's what's kind of what's wrong with the responses of, of Joseph and these women from Galilee because these are people who heard what Jesus had said, even claimed to believe what Jesus said, and yet their response to him dying was to expect him to stay dead. Now, what they did is what we would do for people who we love and they pass on or die. We have a funeral for them or we maybe have a nice casket or an urn and we put it in a place of prominence where we can visit and we can honor the memory. 
The problem is, Jesus is not like anyone else. And Jesus is the only one that didn't stay dead when it came to what happened and what was done through him. He told them. He told them he wasn't going to stay dead, and yet they still treated him like he was going to stay dead. And people have been doing this for millennia now, Christians even, for millennia, is the best that we give Jesus is an honorable mention. The best that we give is, is the plan that Joseph had, that his body is going to stay underground, that the women had, that they were going to make these anointings and these spices because eventually his body is going to rot and start to stink, and so we need to get it anointed. And so we honor a dead Jesus, much like Christians have always done, is that we think that what he did was kind of great, but that's it, and that's where we leave him. And when we have this attitude and the response to Easter is that some dead guy once did a thing that was good for us, and we leave it there, we tend to then live out our lives as if the best we can do is just simply kind of loosely honor him. And so Christians have been building monuments and, and buildings and, and large crucifixes and, and carry around this mournful and somber attitude about Jesus Christ because the best they've got is a dead one. I don't know if you know who these two guys are. There's no real reason you should. They are Hieta de Silva Costa and Paul Landowski. These two men are the two men that are most responsible for the creation of Christo Redentor, or in English, Christ the Redeemer, which is the monument over Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Jesus Christ with arms spread wide, 635 tons of stone used to create this monument to display without doubt, the most important figure in all of mankind's history. As I looked up about the creation of this monument, what you can't find is anything to do with the faith of these two men. What these two guys believe. One of them's a phenomenal engineer, one of them's a world-renowned sculptor, but what they actually believed they were building and why if it was worshipful or if it was just something that someone else wanted done, it begs a question. In fact, if you look a little bit deeper into how most people view the Cristo Redentor now, it's a great tourist attraction. It's something that's meaningful, but not meaningful for the real reason of worshiping and celebrating a living Jesus. Washington Post did an article and got a quote from a local from Rio to describe what it meant to them. And they said that statue is really important for us in Rio and for the people of Brazil. It has a lot of good things behind it. Not just the religious symbol, but this welcoming symbol of open arms, it's also supposed to mean that we are good hosts. Now, I don't think you create a 635-ton stone monument just to say, hey, we kind of like having people in our town. It probably had something deeper meaning behind it, but when we don't actually build things to celebrate a living Jesus, it, in the end, it tends to become a shell of what it once was, and people have different opinions about why it's even there. It's kind of like church buildings from beautiful brand new church buildings, this one in South America, to beautiful golden ornate ones from Russia. We build these things, and at one point it meant a place for people to worship the living Jesus. But over time, that decidedly dies away, and again they become monuments and tombs to a dead faith. This next uh, picture is of a building uh, that exists in the city of York and is actually just down the road from where I was born. And it is known as the York Minster. And if you're ever in York in the UK, you should go visit. It's breathtaking. And you'll be surrounded by lots of other tourists because that's primarily what it is now. This building that its construction began in the 13th century as a place of worship a place to celebrate the living Jesus is now mostly empty apart from tourists. And it costs, as its website claims, a whopping 30,000 pounds a day to maintain it and upkeep it. Now, why am I saying these things? I don't hate art, I love history, and I love the history of the church, but something seems a little bit screwed and skewed when what we as Christians are actually most known for is building buildings. 
or putting up monuments or pictures and statues of this person who once did a thing to the point that people will look at the things that have been created and say it maybe points to a time in which people actually believed in this guy, but no one seemingly does today. And so the church can be found honoring a dead guy rather than worshiping the living Jesus. Here's what honoring someone who is dead continues to look like. In chapter 24, verse 1, it says, Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there, puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. And then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. This was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up, he ran to the tomb to look, stooping, peered in, saw the empty linen wrappings, then he went home again, wondering, What had happened? For us to spend our lives responding, or maybe even response isn't the right term, accepting maybe there once was a Jesus, but not accepting who he actually was and that he didn't stay dead, what we must be willing to do is consciously refuse the testimony of those who saw it happen. We must be willing to believe that this historical document, which has been proven and verifiable back through the centuries, that this is nonsense. We must be willing to take names and dates and proofs provided and not believe a word of it. And we spend, it's amazing how much time we spend and people debate and they write books about all these things about Jesus and they say, I wonder who he really was. I wonder what really happened not being willing to believe the testimony of those who were actually there. So we begrudge biblical testimony, and then we also begrudge the testimony of believers over the last 2,000 years who've been impacted by Jesus. Because it didn't happen directly to us, we don't want to believe that it happened at all. So the man that overcame three decades of alcoholism because he was impacted by Jesus Christ, that we begrudge. We begrudge the reality that the marriage still exists and is now thriving when for all reason it should be dead if it weren't for Jesus. The miraculous healing, the overcoming of sin, and instead we try and come up with, well, maybe it was something else. Maybe it's a coincidence. I wonder what really happened. Here's a good example for you. In 2005, uh, I came over to the U.S., Uh, to visit my friend. My friend, my best friend in elementary school, moved over to Columbus, Indiana, right after elementary school, and his mom bought me a ticket when I was 18, 19 to come visit. Now, just before I came to visit, Hurricane Katrina hit the southern coast of the continental U.S. and hit it hard. Once I was there, their church started talking about sending a relief team, a missions team. Now, I wasn't planning on doing anything like that. I was planning on taking a break from life in the most boring state in the continental U.S. But, sorry if there's any Hoosiers in the room. But I was young, and I was dumb, and my back still worked, and so I thought, yeah, I'll go down there. I can get put to work. And so on a missions trip, a skeptic, an unbeliever, and all the time that I'm spending with these people, they... They tell me about Jesus, and they they tell me that he's alive today, and that he's working miracles today, and I'm just listening, but not really believing, and one of the projects that we were given to do was to tear out um, an old warehouse, rather large warehouse, where because of the flooding, all the water damage, all the tile, all the sheetrock, all the moldy studs, everything had to come out, and after a few days of doing this, one of the guys, a guy called Bill, 
big dude, like law enforcement, looks like he could snap you in half if he wanted to, that kind of guy. He had lost his wedding ring. At lunchtime, he was telling us he'd lost his wedding ring because he'd taken it off because he was scraping tile with a floor scraper and it was pinching on his finger. He'd taken it off and he'd put it in his pocket only to find out hours later he had a hole in his pocket. Now, to put this into scope, it's a massive warehouse where we're just tearing everything out, massive piles, wheelbarrowing out and just dumping it on this massive football field size rubble pile to be collected by FEMA later. So they got together and said, well, sorry you lost your wedding ring, buddy. Never gonna find it in that pile. Now, skeptic as I am, I thought, but you know, these people say that miracles are still a legit thing. I'm gonna see if they're wrong. In fact, I'm gonna prove that they're wrong. And while they went off to lunch, I snuck outside and I looked up to the sky because that's genuinely where I believe God was at the time. And I offered my first prayer. And I said, God, if you're actually real, would you help me find this man's wedding ring, Bill's wedding ring? Even with all my doubts, I put forward this prayer because something within me actually wanted it to be true. What they were describing, I wanted it to be true. And so I went up to this massive rubble pile, sheetrock and concrete and tile and, and stud work everywhere, and walked up and picked up the first piece of sheetrock I could see, and right underneath it, like in a display cabinet was his golden wedding ring. And I, this was a big moment for me. And I grabbed it and I ran back in. I said, Bill, I found your wedding ring. And to this day, I do not know if he believes me. I do not know if he actually thinks that that's what actually happened or, which is more likely, I'd found it earlier, pocketed it, and now was terrified because it was Bill's. And if Bill found out, he might kill me. But that's actually, that's what happened. That's, that's a testimony of a miracle, one of many God has shown me to show me that it is real. And I don't know if you believe that testimony. Something in your mind is automatically thinking of, well, maybe there was a coincidence, maybe I'd seen it earlier and didn't realize, maybe he's making up, maybe Maddie is a liar and a thief. And yet, that's one of the reasons that 20 years later, here I am telling you about a living Jesus telling you that he is there. But we have this seemingly inability to allow the testimony of others that Jesus didn't stay dead actually affect what we believe about who he was. And so we call it nonsense and we instead wonder what anything else could have been. How else could it have happened? Here's what happens next. That same day, Two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group, a group of his followers, were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they'd see the angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. And Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering into his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us 
since it's getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and he gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. The whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that I'm really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed his hands and his feet. Still they stood there in disbelief, filled with wonder and joy. Then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. It is very easy for someone who wants to believe, even has believed in who Jesus really is, it's super easy for us to become disheartened and sad and to believe less about Jesus because it just doesn't go how we think it will. These two walking away from Jerusalem now where they once thought they'd found the Messiah, how they describe him now on the road, he was a great prophet a mighty teacher for all the people, but we hoped he would be the Messiah and he can't be. And he can't be the Messiah because he didn't do what we expected him to do. You see, when you come and understand who Jesus actually is, but you start with somewhat of a tilted view of what he's promised, a tilted view of what he's said, well then all of a sudden, you're going to find yourself disheartened when he doesn't do what you think he should do. These two guys are a great example. Their greater hope was that Jesus would free the nation of Israel from underneath the oppression of the Romans. And then the Romans and the Jews killed him. He didn't free the nation of Israel, and now he's dead. He can't, and he won't, and it's all over. How many people who have wanted to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus, how many of us have made inner vows, promises to ourselves that if God is real, he will do this. If Jesus is real, then this is how my faith is going to go. Promises we make that he then doesn't fulfill. So even then, when we're in and around the presence of Jesus Christ, doing the things that he promised to do, to forgive you of sin, to free you from the control of sin, to give you the ability to love him and to love people, even when those things are happening, we're disheartened because he didn't do the things he never said he would do. It's the equivalent of leaving like a one-star Google review for a plumber and saying he came on time and he fixed all the pipes, but on his way out, he didn't even offer to trim the grass. And you're like, that's not what he was there to do. It's not what he needed most. Jesus didn't die. He didn't die so that we would get everything we wanted. He didn't die so that Israel as a nation would be freed. He didn't die so that we could build mournful monuments, empty buildings, closed Bibles, and give him dead worship. He didn't die so that we would only believe in the parts of him that we have personally experienced of him. In fact, Jesus died so that the eyes of people would become open so that we would actually understand sin and what it has done, and we would understand the need for his death and his resurrection. Because that is what a good God would do when faced with a bunch of people that dishonor him, don't believe in him, and sin against him. This is what he said next to those who were gathered around him. He said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the Lord, Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said, yeah, it was written 
long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day, it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses to all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Jesus says is I've, I've done what God promised to do because a good God will offer forgiveness of our sins. He's so much better than we are. He's not gonna sweep it all under the rug and say, there, there, it's fine. He's not gonna shy away from what our sin has done. To help us understand it better, he points to the bloody mangled corpse of his son being carried away by Joseph of Arimathea and says, that's what sin does. That's the consequence. But he doesn't, just like we consider he might, continue to point at it and say, you should all feel real bad about yourselves. He then points at an empty tomb. He says, now for those who repent, sin's forgiven, it's done, it's resurrected, there's new life promised to you. He says these things so we would know, just like it says in the scriptures, that there is forgiveness for those who will repent. And that we, you and I, we become witnesses to these things. We become witnesses of witnesses and we continue to know more and more of who Jesus Christ is. Not living lives that simply honor a dead guy a couple of times a year. Not refuting the testimony of scripture or of those amongst us who encounter him. But instead learning to engage in a living relationship with Jesus. Now this might be hard for many of you as it was for me. Maybe you grew up like I grew up and church was dead and you went to a big empty, mostly empty building and you were told stories about a dead guy. And, and maybe you even gave him a little bit of honor and sang songs about a dead guy. Or maybe you put a dollar in a golden plate wondering why a dead guy needs money. Maybe you experience walking through the wastewater of catastrophe in life wondering if Jesus is actually alive, where is he now? Maybe you've experienced testimonies from others that just don't line up to you. Or maybe you're saddened. Maybe your face is saddened because this faith thing didn't live up to the hype that you yourself hoped it would, not the way you wished and hoped it would go. And now, many people calling themselves Christians live in fear and in doubt, not being able to talk about it, left there in a place considering, is he actually alive or did he actually stay dead? And if it were just to us on our own power, that's where we'd all stay, not knowing. And yet when I've been in this place of not knowing, there was something within me that burned for something different. Something since we were young told us that our life was meaningful, purposeful, that we had worth and that we had identity. And yes, the world's done its best to squash that out of you, but still something burns within us, burns that it's supposed to be different. And I believe that thing that burns within us is that we would actually know that Jesus is alive, that he's breathing, that he's living, that he's mediating on our behalf, that he wants victory for us because it brings God glory. I think we actually want to know how much we're loved by Jesus. And if we refuse to believe the testimony that Jesus died, we'll never fathom how much we're loved. Scripture says we know the greatest love that someone can ever give anyone else is to die for them, to want to sacrifice their life for them. If you refuse to admit that Jesus died for you, you'll never actually know how ridiculously loved you are. And if you refuse to believe the testimony that Jesus didn't stay dead, well, then that's the best it could be. A dead guy once loved you. Not that you now can have new life, not that you can now experience the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus died so that we would know. He was resurrected so that we would know, not have to wonder what really happened. He died and was resurrected so that we could have peace, not fear and doubt. This is what it means to live a life actually worshiping a living Jesus rather than honoring a dead one. 
is the final words of Luke 24. It says, then Jesus led them to Bethany and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. So they worshiped him and then returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy. And they spent all their time in the temple praising God. See, that right there is the real response to what really happened at Easter. Not some lesser version diluted and refuted, but actually what happened that would draw out of us a genuine worship of a living Jesus who would die for us, who would be resurrected for us, and who now sits beside his Father in heaven waiting for us to come home, empowering us by his Spirit to have our eyes opened, our minds open, so that we could believe, so that we could see, so that we could love. As we wrap up our time together here, painfully aware that we're about to disperse. We're going to leave here, and maybe you're going to go and get dinner. Maybe you're going to go hang out as a family. Maybe you're going to go home alone. Maybe you're going to go back to your prison cell. Maybe, but no matter where you go, today is going to end. Like all the days before it, the day is going to go by. Easter weekend's going to go by, and then we're going to be in normalcy of life yet again. And if Easter just means a weekend, just means a day, a little bit more time off, then that's all it will ever mean. But we're not here because of a day. And you weren't dragged to church kicking and screaming by a loved one just so you could celebrate a day. We are all brought to this place so that we could respond rightly and respond fully to who Jesus really is. So with the closing of our time, I want to give you time to think, consider, have your mind open and eyes open to know who Jesus really is, I don't want you to leave here without having that opportunity. The music team is going to lead us in a song of worship. And unlike what is normal, I'm going to ask you not to stand up right away. I'm going to ask you not to sing right away. I'm going to ask you not to leave right away, but instead, to have an interaction time with your God, to talk to him and to ask him for what you need to have eyes opened, to have who Jesus is revealed. I believe for us to respond correctly to Easter, it takes something miraculous. It takes a work of God for us to truly see it and to truly get it. You see, Jesus doesn't leave us in our disbelief and unbelief and our doubt and our fear. He doesn't scorn that. He doesn't hate that. He gets that. Just like Joseph or Mary or the disciples or Peter or the two guys on the road or me or you, He is in the business of showing you how real he is. And so the scripture we just read, there's three definitive moments in which he does what only he can do. For the women who had forgotten that Jesus said he would rise from the dead, angels reminded them, and man, were they full of worship. For the guys who just could not see and could not recognize Jesus, Their eyes were opened and they could see him for who he really was. For the disciples, for the disciples who couldn't believe in testimony of others, he showed up to them directly. And so here's what I'm asking you to do, encouraging you to do, is to ask God for what you need to be putting your faith in who Jesus Christ really was, the fact that he didn't stay dead. So maybe you're here and your faith is a little bit shaken and it's a little bit saddened because it's not gone how you thought it would. I'd ask that you ask God to show you the beauty and the magnificence of what Christ did accomplish by having your sins forgiven and you rectified in relationship with him, that that is a greater thing for him to do for you. If you're here and you just can't see this, you don't want to admit this, you just cannot consider that Jesus didn't stay dead, then... I challenge you to ask God to open your eyes, if he's there, if he's real, for him to show you. If you don't believe the testimony of others, that you'd ask God to give you testimony, that he would show himself real and tangible in your life, irrefutable and unmistakable. For those of you who do consider Jesus to be alive, you believe that and you know that, don't miss this opportunity to give God great glory and worship by yet again offering and asking, how do you want me to live this life of worship? So that I and we would not become a people who build dead monuments, who leave behind us empty churches, 
children who don't follow in the Lord. But instead, he would show us how to worship. He would show us how to take every piece of our lives and say, whatever you want to do with this, that's going to be the best. Let's do that. After you've taken some time talking with the Lord, then I'd have you stand and worship. Then I'd have you declare that he's alive. And sing like he's alive. Sing like you've been forgiven of your sin. Sing like you're destined for heaven. Sing like you actually know how to respond to the real Easter. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you that in our forgetfulness and in even our own sense of fear and doubt, you do not leave us. That you place your spirit within us to burn within us for the thing that is real, for the thing in our souls that is genuine, that you are alive and at work in our lives. That you have a greater desire to see us come to salvation and to put our trust in you than we ever could. We thank you that you saved us before we could even consider the need to be saved. And that the amount of sin matters not to you, but matters is that we would repent and turn to you. I thank you for these things because it's not like we would do it. I thank you that you don't condemn. Thank you that you don't work by force or fear. I thank you that Jesus died humbly. I thank you that he was resurrected majestically. And I ask now that we would not go another day, week, month, or year without responding rightly to what Easter truly means. That we are a people of worth. We are a people of purpose. That you truly delight in our creation and our worship. That we have the opportunity to do something phenomenally glorifying with the rest of our days. I'd ask you to help everyone in the room take hold of this. For your glory and for our good and in Jesus' name. Amen.